Today's major, uh, we talked in the last class about the diseases of the Egyptians, the major diseases, but basically the major causes of death in America, cancer, heart disease, and I put diabetes in there too. Now diabetes is usually listed as the number 10 cause of death. But the trouble is that it greatly increases your risk of cancer up to 400%, heart disease up to 400%, and all other kinds of things. So basically it is a factor in the other diseases. Now, what is cancer? We, just, we, we defined what disease was the last class. Do you remember what the definition of disease was? It said it was an effort in nature to free itself from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. But now let's look just more specifically about what is cancer. It is a malignant neoplasm. Neoplasm means just a new formation, new growth. This is a patient of mine, or a, a young man that I worked with in Zimbabwe. He was 18 years old. That's his left knee. That's a tumor. I took this picture probably the second week in December. He had had it removed three months before. That's three months of growth. Some cancers are extremely aggressive. Others, matter of fact, an interesting study that showed that if you have men who have undiagnosed prostate cancer, they live longer than those who have diagnosed prostate cancer. Why? All the things they do to the prostate cancer. Just better, some of it grows very, very slowly. How many types of cancer are there? There's over 100 different types of cancers. These are just the ones that begin with A, B, and C. And every cancer is different. Every person's different. So we can't just treat everything the same. Um, what are some of the main causes of cancer? Well, we've talked about it. You know, the average talk about fat there, tobacco we know is a bad one, lack of exercise, uh, meat, and ionizing radiation. Hopefully we're going to get through that much today. Um, all cancers are a result of multiple mutations. What is this right here? That's the DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. And these mutations are due to interaction with the environment. What's the condition of our environment today? Now, I told you in the last class I used different programs. I did my, used my Japanese cancer program to make my English Japanese programs. Every once in a while you're gonna see Japanese. Sorry about that. But basically it's saying um, uh, our air, our water, basically the environment that we are in right now. Now, the question was asked in the last class about essential oils, things that you smell. And uh, you mentioned de trying to de detoxify. You remember Hurricane Katrina, all right? What did our lovely government, FEMA, do for all those homeless people? They sent trailers, mobile homes. And within two years, at least one person in every home had cancer or some other type of chronic disease. Why? The trailers were outgassing. What is outgassing? Today, everything is made from chemicals. They've got chemicals, even the paint on the walls are made with things that will prevent mold and mildew. But these are gas, these, these are poisons that are gonna outgas. If you have a, they did a study. They took a cage of rabbits and they put a new piece of carpet in front of the rabbits, in the front of the cage, and had a fan blowing over the carpet into the cage, killed every rabbit. If you have new carpet, here's what you do. Get the carpet installed, open the windows, put on an exhaust fan, and go on a vacation and try to get that thing out gassed. All right. Huh? <laughs> The longer the better, let's put it that way. It's gonna be outgassing for a long, long time. Matter of fact, you like that new car smell? It's carcinogenic. It's chemicals you're smelling, folks. All right, let's, won't get, not, 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 not trying to make you paranoid, but the house I just built, I'm building in Kentucky, no carpets on the floors. All right, here's how, this is the etology. This is the growth of a cancer you get one cell that gets mutated. It's not cancer yet, but it's, it's not working right. Well, when it gets that way, it's going to get um, 
hyperplasia is going to start increasing a little bit faster. It's going to grow because there's something wrong with this DNA is growing too fast. Then it's going to get dysplasia. It means that one of them is getting really bad. All right? This is getting close to cancer until you have insight to cancer. Now we've got cancer that's developed. And next one is invasive cancer that's going to start metastasizing to other parts of the body. So basically, where does it begin? One cell in the body. How many of you have had cancer? Every one of you have had cancer. Every one of you have had that one cell. But if your immune system is strong, you never know it. It takes it right out. If you're getting plenty of sunshine, it takes it right out. There's so many things that God put in nature to get rid of these things, you'll never know that you had it. It's when we start, right? Ecclesiastes 10, verse 8. It says, he that breaks a hedge, does anyone know what the rest of the verse says? A serpent shall bite him. Who's the serpent? Devil. What's the hedge? The laws that God has around us. Does he have laws around us? What did Satan say to God about Job? You've got a hedge around him. Because Job was faithful to God. And he says, you break, and I'll use my own words, you break that hedge, and he's going, to, he's going to curse you. And he says, you can break the hedge, but you can't go by the second hedge. You can, you can take everything he has, but you can't touch him. All right, that didn't work. Now you can touch him, but you can't take his life. He can only go as far as we allow. We allow. We have to be faithful. And here's what I know. On every step on the road to cancer, there's a way to turn it off. And we're going to look at some of these ways. That if we live the lifestyle, it's not a disease that we should be worried about. How many studies have been done on cancer? This just talks about 4,500. There have been countless thousands of studies on cancer. So a bunch of scientists sat down and looked at 4,500 of the studies. And this was their conclusion. We don't need any more research. If we would do what we already know, cancer rates would fall. It's that simple. And what, what was the thing that they found out? They had a common thread through all the studies. What was the common thread? Cancer and diet. Diet is what they were looking at. Every study says, now, is this a good anti-cancer food? You know what the food is, broccoli. Which form is it the most anti-cancer? That's number three. Yeah, it surprises you, doesn't it? Number two, lightly steamed. It breaks the sulfur bond and lets the sulforaphane work on the cancer. Number one, broccoli sprouts. Now, you can eat raw, fine. It's still a great anti-cancer. But one-third, this is good news, one-third of all cancers are caused by tobacco. Why is that good news? If you don't smoke, you just cut your risk by a third. Another third is caused by improper diet. Yeah, I was making sure it wasn't some foreign language. That's another good news. If you're eating a good plant-based, whole food vegetarian diet, you just cut your risk by more than two-thirds because now the food's become your medicine. As a matter of fact, that's what Socrates said. Let your food be your medicine and your medicine be your food. Now, possible factors in cancer development. Pay attention. One, heredity. What did Angelina Jolie do because she knew that she had breast cancer in her family? Double mastectomy. Double mastectomy. Crazy. Anyway, heredity. Second, aging. You're entering into the cancer age, okay? That, what, what do the doctors tell you you should do once you reach the age of 50? Two things. Colonoscopy. Colonoscopy and? All right, mammograms. All right, now I should have said three then. For the other one, you've got to have your prostate checked every year, your PSA every year. Because they expect us, well, they're saying that old age is a disease. Inflammation. Every disease has as its foundation inflammation. Tobacco use, 
Alcohol use greatly increases your risk of many types of cancers. Cancer-causing substances in your own home, your shampoos, your soap sometimes, your cleaning solvents. What's the best cleaning solvent that's going to be anti-cancer? That's going to be non-toxic? All right, lemon, very good. Get some vinegar, put some lemon peel in there for about a week, put a few drops of um, oil of oregano, or oregano, however you want to pronounce it, take the peel out, and you've got something that's going to kill anything and clean very nicely. All right, viruses, viruses, a Nobel Prize laureate in the 1950s showed us that many cancers are caused by viruses. What does Sister White say? Well, in her day, they didn't have the word virus. But here's what she says. Man is constantly eating meat that's swarming with cancerous germs. She used the word germs. Had they already coined the word virus, she would have said viruses, and she would have gotten the Nobel Prize. <laughs> diet, not enough fruits and vegetables in her diet, too much meat. Obesity, greatening increases a woman's risk of endometrial cancer by 12 times if she's obese. Ionizing radiation, we're gonna spend a little bit of time on that if we have enough time. Lack of exercise, a weakened immune system. Now, let's look at all those again. Can you do something about alcohol consumption? Oh, yes. They could be, but there could be other thing. We didn't mention about eating a lot of sugar. Sugar will knock your immune system down to the knees, if not completely knock it out. Um, so, but and, and improper dress is going to weaken your immune system. But yeah, you're right. But all right, can we do something about alcohol? Yeah, just don't drink the stuff. Can we do something about tobacco? Just don't smoke the stuff. Can we do something about overweight? Absolutely. How about cancer-causing substances? Get your vinegar and your lemon peel. How about inflammation? We had a patient come, we do a cancer seminar every year in Japan. <clears throat> we had a professor from Tokyo come. This was in September. In August, she'd been given three months to live. She had stage four breast cancer. And I remember the first night, she was sitting over here, and I saw her holding her blouse away from her left breast. Right breast was already gone. Very painful. She had a discharge. I knew she was uncomfortable. I told you that I had the accident. Uh, that was four months before this. Cal Thrash had brought to me in a hospital a bottle of tablets. You know what the tablets were? Curcuma. What's curcuma? Turmeric. Turmeric capsules. They're anti-inflammatory, anti-pain. I didn't take them, but I took them to Japan with me. As soon as I was done with my lecture, I ran to my room, I got the bottle, came down and says, look, take one of these every night and one every morning. The next morning, she was sitting there normal and she's still doing fine. That's been over four years ago. And she tells us, everything goes great until I start getting off the lifestyle. Now, the lifestyle, not the turmeric. Don't look for the silver bullet in one thing. It's the whole platter, okay? All right, so we can do something about inflammation. Take anti-inflammatories, turmeric, uh, flaxseed, whatever. Can we eat more fruits and vegetables and less meat? We certainly can. How about making the immune system strong? I can give you a whole class on that. How about getting more exercise? Yes. How about ionizing radiation? You might say, well, nothing we can do about that. Yes, there is. I'll show you about that. And viruses. What's left? Age. Age and? Genetics. Heredity. But on Friday, I'm going to tell you, even that is out the window. And frankly, this is relative. My father was an old man when he died. He was 57. I'm 70. My mother is 94. We're still perking right along. I had a patient some years ago. Um, he, was he was from Florida. He was diagnosed with prostate cancer, was metastatic to the bones. Um, 
PSA, prostate specific antigen, which is the sort of a marker that we sometimes look at, it should be between zero and three. I just uh, was talking to a friend of mine who what I went to academy with, he had a prostatectomy and his PSA was eight. Eight. This guy's was 232. They came to UT Pines, not religious people, um, but you might notice we pray a lot here and you know, lifestyle change and everything else. And so he and his wife, he's, he was an older man, had a younger wife, they both started praying. And he would, they would read Ministry of Healing every night before they went to bed. I mean, it was amazing. Uh, because when people are at the end of their lives, they start, you, you ever heard the saying, there's no uh, atheist in foxholes? Sometimes that's the case. They were praying. So you just got your blood draw on the day. Two weeks after they arrived, they, we draw it again to see what's happening. They were praying that his PSA would be two. 232 down to two in two weeks. They were both praying for that. God has a sense of humor. At the end of two weeks, his PSA was 2.2. <laughs> they both got it too. He went back to his hospital, his big hospital in Orlando. They could not find cancer anywhere in his body. Every six months, they had him come back for five years. And then it came back again. And I asked him, what did we do wrong? He says, you didn't do anything wrong. He says, I went on a vacation. He went back to his old lifestyle. They got another two. He died in two months of prostate cancer. Sister White tells us it never goes away. It encapsulates. Now, yeah, that one cell goes away. But once you've got a major cancer, the body gets under control, but it encapsulates it. And as long as we keep the guard, the hedge around this, it's not going to bother us. It's when we start to play games. I had a patient in, UG, uh, in, in Japan. Uh, she had breast cancer. We did some treatments there, and then she came to UT Pines. And when she went home, they couldn't find cancer. Her doctor had her come back every month for nine months trying to find cancer. She couldn't, couldn't find it. She was well. But after a while, she, she decided, you know, I really used to like sugar. I'll just eat a little bit of candy. The last time I saw her, she was laying there on her couch in her living room. You draw a line through her body, the whole right side was swollen. I've never seen it like, this was swollen, this was normal. She died of breast cancer. And I'll tell you why here when we get on to this thing. Okay, so um, we, we talked about some of the laws of health before. The, how many laws of health are there? Right, now, correct her now. Tell her what's right. 15 laws of health. See, you missed a great class. Okay. Um, sunlight will protect us from 16 types of cancers. Matter of fact, um, what's the factor in sunlight that protects us from cancer? Vitamin D. It's the sunshine vitamin. Three types of those cancers are female cancers. And it's, we find it when a woman has low vitamin D and it, it most, well, let's put it this way, most breast cancer patients have low levels of vitamin D. And unless we can raise that up, it increases her risk of metastasis by 94% and increases her risk of dying by 73%. We've got a treatment room for breast cancer patients. Have you seen it? You go out the back door. It's a building with no roof. You lay in the sunshine. Any cancer, lay in the sunshine. Don't burn your skin. What happens if you burn your skin? Call it melanoma. Malignant melanoma, bad new stuff. But here's another study. This is a study done in, in New Mexico, the land of enchantment, all the sunshine down there. Um, they looked at 528 cases of people with melanoma which is a very invasive, very quick moving cancer. And here's what they found out. Those who had received the most sunshine had the less mortality. How did they know who, how did they know who had the most sunshine? 
They looked at the skin because it does age the skin. Those who had very wrinkly skin died less of their melanoma. But, all right, here's what sunshine does. Sunshine does a lot of wonderful things. No, here's the other factor, that's right. It takes two things to get melanoma. One, too much sunshine, what do we call that? Sunburn, plus a high fat diet. That's what's going to give you melanoma. Um, sunshine makes the immune system stronger. Now we talked about the immune system, sunshine will make it stronger. And that's what we need, a strong immune system. Matter of fact, here's four things. Um, sunshine is going to make your immune, uh oh, sorry, Japanese. That's called immune system stronger. It's going to increase oxygen to the body. Cancer hates oxygen. It's going to increase your vitamin D levels. It's going to lower your blood pressure. All those things together will lead to lower rates of cancer. Now, can you do those four things? You just get out in the sunshine, you're doing all four of those things. I mentioned that all of you have had cancer. Sometimes it gets away from that one cell and you develop a small tumor. All right, now let's go back to review the first class we gave, had today. What's the first silver pillar? The first law on that silver pillar. Book of Leviticus, chapter 17, verse 11. Okay. It is, the life is in the blood, chapter 7, verse 11. Um, it's a law. Even for tumors, they have to have blood. A small tumor gets blood from its, from its neighbors. But as it starts to grow, it's going to produce what's called some angiogenic, some factors that cause angiogenesis, or the growth of a tumor. And these tumors will cause capillaries to begin to form to the tumor until now you have a cancer tumor that's full of its own blood vessels. And what that mean? It's gonna get plenty of blood going in and it's gonna have plenty of the cancer cells going out for the rest of the body to enjoy. Can we stop cancer at this point? We gotta stop those angiogenic factors, those growth factors. How do we do that? COX-2 inhibitors such as resveratrol in red grapes. Have you heard the benefits of red grapes? How does science tell you to take the red grapes? Wine, exactly right. Trouble is wine is toxic. And what is it in the wine that's healing? It's the resveratrol, eat the red grapes. And the curcumin in turmeric. We've already talked about that. Suppress the tumor's production of growth factors. Of, you know somebody with cancer, get them on red grapes and curcuma. Um, now there's a better way to take the curcuma. Um, you can just get the turmeric powder, mix it with water and drink it. But it's, it, very little of that is uptaken by the body. Here's what you want to do. You want to mix it with some oil, like I like coconut oil. Coconut's very good for your brain. You mix them together and you spread it on a piece of bread and you eat that, or you bring some water to a boil, how much water, people always say, as much water as you want, as much water as you can drink in a couple of hours. You boil the water, once it's boiling, you add a couple spoonfuls of turmeric, curcuma, let it simmer for 10 minutes, cool and drink that. You're gonna get 12 times more curcuma in your body. All right, so we got red grapes, we've got curcuma, we can also use digenistin in, um, in soybeans, in soy milk. Soy milk's very healthy, that's the Japanese soy milk there. But it suppresses the tumor's production of growth factors. Johns Hopkins University came up with a list of things that feed cancer. Uh, milk, near the top of the list. I'm not gonna tell you what's at the top of this because Dr. Sandoval's gonna be talking about that one, but cancer feeds on mucus. How many of you have ever heard of an athlete named Flojo? Florence Joyner. Florence Griffin Joyner. She was one of the most fantastic runners you've ever seen. When she was found dead in her hotel room, she had a one pound ball of mozzarella cheese in her stomach. She was very allergic to dairy products. Um, she was a black American, which means African origin, 
90 to 95% of Africans have an allergy to dairy products. And for her, it killed her. It produces mucus. All of her, every cell in her body was extremely congested with mucus. They've been doing the study in Japan since 1946, looking at all these demographic things about the height, weight, disease, diet, and everything else. And um, this is a study that was, was published in Preventive Medicine. And they looked at one 25-year period of this study, basically from 1950 to 1975. How much dairy were they taking? In 1950, two and a half kilos per person per year. By 1975, 53.3 kilos per person per year. What was the difference in disease rates? Um, strokes went up 38%. Heart disease went up 35%. Breast cancer went up 77%. Colon cancer went up 77%. Lung cancer went up 300%. But that's not the worst of it. What did it do to puberty? In 1950s, the average Japanese girl reached the age of puberty, or menses, at the age of 15.2 years. I doubt that you know too many girls doing that today. You've got 10, 11 year olds looking like grown ups. Um, 25 years later, they lost three years, which makes this woman f far more susceptible to breast cancer because every period you have increases your risk of breast cancer. And this gave her 36 more periods over this girl right here. Another thing in dairy products, insulin-like growth factor. Um, it is made up of 70 amino acids. It's a peptide chain. It's a very powerful growth factor. Humans have it in their bodies. But God made the body. He made the production of it. It's just right. But there's another animal in nature that has the same growth for, or, uh, factor, and that is bovine and it's in the bovine milk. So drinking milk is going to greatly increase. Matter of fact, here's my friend, uh, his name was Francis. He died of this cancer, by the way. Um, tenfold increase in RNA levels of cancer cells. 10 times greater. Uh, one of them, breast cancer, this is a patient of mine in, in um, Malaysia, no, in um, Taiwan, is critically involved in the aberrant growth of human breast cancer cells. If you know somebody with cancer, they get off of milk now. Not just milk, cheese, yogurt, ice cream, wherever else you're gonna find it, you gotta get rid of. Another one is chlorine. They find that outside of every city area where the chlorine water is always chlorinated, as you go out into the country, cancer rates go down 87%. 93%, yeah, 93, sorry. Um, Meat, it's high acid food. What is the pH of meat? What does pH stand for? We always talk about pH. It stands for hydrogen potential. We've got P, potential, hydrogen. H, big H, which is, stands for hydrogen. Cancer loves an uh, a acid environment. Meat is about 5, 2 to 5, 7. Milk is 6. What is the ideal pH for the human body? I'm gonna give you a formula. You will never forget it from this day forward. I like to find things very simple. How many days are in a week? Oops, all right. Seven days in a week, okay. How many days are in a year? That's your perfect pH. God knew. He wanted us to remember that. I know back in, ancient days, it was 360 days a year in the Jewish calendar, but we got 365. We're living in the cancer age right now. 10 year study, looking at a huge amount of women, 40 years old or older, talking about eating meat. If they rarely or ever ate meat, they had a relative risk of getting breast cancer of one. If they ate it on a daily basis, the risk went up 8.5 times or 850% greater risk of breast cancer. We don't need to be eating meat today. Uh, vitamin C prevents the formation of carcinogens from nitrates in the colon. When you think about vitamin C, what's missing from the picture? Oranges. Oranges. 
Kiwis are higher. Red bell peppers are higher. Greens, broccoli, they're very high in vitamin C. Every 12 minutes, a woman dies, when well, I say women, do men get breast cancer? Yes. Every 12 minutes, someone dies from breast cancer. Yet, if I should take women out of there, if they eat just two servings of vegetables a day, they reduce their risk by 30%. Now, I know all of you eat that much. There are some people who don't eat any. Whole, fresh, unprocessed fruits and vegetables a day. Interesting. All right, men. Now, women, you don't have to worry about this one. Men, unless your husband gets it. Prostate cancer patients consume a diet high in fat, meat, and dairy products. Than those. So basically, as you add meat, milk, eggs, and cheese, and one other factor, which is overweight, you greatly increase your risk of prostate cancer. I don't worry about prostate cancer. Matter of fact, does it do any good to worry? What does Sister White, she def, what does she say about worry? She says, worry is blind and cannot discern the future. But God knows the end from the beginning. In every situation, he is his way of escape. Those who accept the one principle of making the service and honor of God supreme will find perplexities vanish in a plain path before their feet. If we get a cancer, go back to God and go back to his way. Okay, women who eat eggs daily have a 3.8 times higher risk of uh, breast cancer than those who eat it once a week or less. And a three times greater risk of fatal ovarian cancer. If it's an egg, it comes from the reproductive system of a chicken, it's going, to, it's going to affect the reproductive system of the human being. Okay, cancer loves sugar. Yes, it really does. Um, it increases many different types of cancers. How many receptor cells, uh, receptor sites are on a normal plasma cell uh, in your body for insulin? Res insulin, uh, you're not going to know the answer. It's 20,000. That's very important when we get talking about diabetes on Thursday. But cancer cells, what are they like? Sugar. So they're going to have more receptor sites for insulin because insulin is the way that it gets into the cell. They don't have 20,000. They've got 15 times more. So if you know somebody with cancer, what are you going to tell them? No sugar. Well, how about some syrup? No sugar. How about honey? No sugar. What's, can't you hear? Anything that's sugar, refined, whether it's white sugar or whatever type of sugar it is, brown sugar, it's just brown sugar is white sugar with molasses added to it. Read the ingredients. I'm talking when you juice it. When you juice it, that's, that's good. Matter of fact, we give our cancer patients juices. But you got to remember, too, that when you're drinking a juice, you're not getting the fiber. So don't major on juices. The nice thing about a juice is you're going to get more bang for the buck. You're going to get a bigger wallop of the uh, beta carotene or whatever it is you're trying to get out of the carrot or whatever you're using. So drink that, but the fruit juice is basically, what, what type of food is it? Fat, protein, or carbohydrate? It's carbohydrate. Where does carbohydrate digestion begin? In the mouth, because you've got digestive amylase in your digestive uh, uh, enzymes in your mouth. And so basically, if you're going to drink juice, you Put it in your mouth and you chew it to get the enzymes in there to help it to be able to be used in your body. Dietary fiber increases the elimination of carcinogens from the body. Um, we already looked at fiber sources in the last class. There's the fiber, there's the no fiber. <clears throat> a good vegetarian we have a thing called the transit time. The transit time is the amount of time it takes food to go from your mouth to the, to the rectum or the anus. Basically, for a vegetarian, it's measured in hours, 18 to 30 hours to get it through the system. That's good. That means, now, is your food, is almost everything toxic today? Is almost everything have something wrong with it today? 
Yes. So the less contact it has with your digestive system, the less chance it has of passing on into your body. So swiftly through, you're going to get your nutrients out, but not the, the um, carcinogens. But now, a person who has a meat-based diet, we don't measure it in hours. We measure it in days. Three, four, five, six, seven days. Now someone says, well, I don't, and, and what do we call that? So in Japanese, it's bempi. We call it constipation. Now people say, I'm not constipated, I go to the toilet every day. That's not the question. What you just deposited in the throne, when did that food go into your body? Could be seven days ago. And now it's been giving off all the toxins. Um, okay, talk about the, the things that we, we talked about this at the beginning, things that will affect your DNA. Uh, it's your environment, the air is bad, the, the uh, water's bad, fantastically bad, and relationships even bad. But when we, when we start mutating the DNA, what's going to happen? That's what we call cancer. It all begins with the mutation of the DNA. It can be mutated by what's called a free radical. This is a free radical. What's wrong with this particular um, atom here? Notice something here? It's missing an electron. When it misses an electron, it's going to have to steal one from its neighbor. And as it steals one from its neighbor, it keeps on stealing until it gets down to the DNA, then you're going to have a mutation. So where do we get free radicals from? Pollution. I live out in a ridge top in Kentucky. Man, there's no pollution out there except for the chemtrails that come constantly lace the sky. Um, cigarette smoke. If you just smell it, if you walk into a hotel, I love the fact they have no smoking hotel rooms, okay? You're getting free radicals. High fat diet, overeating, mental stress, physical exhaustion, injuries. Your immune system makes free radicals. Aging process, too much sunshine, microwave ovens, they cause a destruction of your DNA. Excessive radiation from things like x-rays. I got a lot of those and I broke all my bones a few years ago. Mammograms, Dr. Thrash says, don't get mammograms, get a thermogram, much safer. All right, so does God have a solution for the free radicals he knew we we're gonna be living with in 2017? There are things we call phytochemicals and one of them one class of those things are called antioxidants. You ever heard of an antioxidant? What does an antioxidant do? Well, let me show you. Here is an antioxidant. Here's just a normal old set, uh, atom. But something's going to go wrong with this atom. What just went wrong with this atom? It lost an electron. So here comes Mr. Antioxidant. What's it going to do? It's going to give up an electron to the free radical. Now, is this a free radical anymore? No. Is this a free radical? That's God's amazing thing. An antioxidant does not become a free radical. It can give up electrons all day long and never become a free radical. Now, how did that evolve? God put that there in the Garden of Eden because he saw us in December 2017. He's made every provision for the people to be perfect in every way in the life that we're living right now. Where we find antioxidants? In the colors. Eat a rainbow. I, I hate the fact that they've bastardized the word rainbow nowadays. They, someone else has taken it up, but we need to be eating a full spectrum. I keep touching this thing and it goes freaky on me. Okay, ionizing radiation. I've got nine minutes to talk about ionizing radiation. Um, in April 1945, two bombs were dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Um, that was the only time nuclear weapons ever been used as, a, as an offensive weapon. They released a lot of ionizing radiation. Basically, it was something like um, 15 times, I forget what, what the amount was, uh, 60 times 10 to the 15th power. That's how many, uh, what they call um, these units they've got there. But in Nagasaki, 
there was a doctor named Dr. Akazuki. He died in 2005. He had a, he worked in a hospital 1.4 kilometers from the hypocenter of the blast. It did not get destroyed by the blast. What killed most of the people from these two atomic bombs? Radiation, Radiation afterwards, not the flash. The afterwards, many people. In his hospital, not one patient, not one staff member got radiation poisoning. What did he do? First thing, no sugar for anybody. Second thing, he put them on a special diet. Now, don't say, I've got to go home and eat just this every day. Tell me what the principle is. First thing, genmai, not hakamai. What's the principle? Whole grain, whole grain, not white flour, whole grain, all right? Uh, miso soup, it has soy in it, it's got some ferments which are very protective from radiation. Hokkaido pumpkin in the squash family, basically eating whole foods. Um, sea vegetables, basically you've got some high minerals in there. And sea salt, that's all he did. What, what form of sea salt do we, most people use today? Himalayan salt. Very, very good to take. It's got all the minerals in it. That's all he did and nobody got, got sick. Now we're not dropping bombs, we got something else happening which is far worse than the two bombs. One is called Chernobyl. Have you heard of Chernobyl? Yeah, I work over in Ukraine a lot. They got big problems over there and it's all the way down to Bulgaria. It's in, it's, it's in a, uh, Israel, it's around the world. And, and a lot of mutations from Chernobyl disasters in the area in the dead zone around there. It causes mutations. And then there is 311. March the 11th, 2011, there's a place called Fukushima Daiichi. You heard of it. That's in Japan. They had the tsunami, had the meltdown there. And I told the people, I, I go there every year, I says, you get ready, you're gonna have some thyroid problems. How do I know that? Because Europe has so many thyroid problems. Mostly hypothyroidism. And now they've got an epidemic of thyroid problems in the Fukushima um, prefecture. And they have their own rabbits without ears, uh, stunted wings on moths, dented eyes, strange looking fruits. This is all in that Fukushima area. Fukushima Daiichi. The chunks of uranium blasted into the seawater around Fukushima have a half-life of 700,000 years. Is Chernobyl still hot? The, radi the reactor in Japan and in, in Ukraine? Yes, it's still hot. It'll be hot for 100 years. This will be hot for 100 years. Jesus will be coming gone. It's gonna burn up in the fires. We've been dropping a lot of stuff in this country. We, they, they, back in the 50s, they did atomic weapons test with audiences. They did a movie in the same area called The Conqueror, with John Wayne and um, whatever her name was, Susan Hayward. Uh, they were in there, um, these and other parts of it. They all died of cancer. Matter of fact, out of 220 people who worked on the movie, um, nearly 100 died of cancer because they were downwind of all these tests coming in. I-9-131 in the seawater around Fukushima Daiichi just before the accident, 1,800 times, 50 times above the legal limit. Wow. And the groundwater under it, groundwater where we get our water from, 10,000 times above the legal limit. You've got decay particles from the, I talked about the 700,000 um, years of half-life. It's always giving off these alpha and beta particles of these ionizing radiation, which basically will go shooting through the cells and cause all kinds of problems. And uh, we can protect ourselves, how to do that. Um, we can get these particles out of the body. How? Drinking more water. They're water soluble. 70% of the body is water. If you get yourself, if you allow yourself to become dehydrated, you're gonna to start to concentrate these particles. Some radioactive pollutants are dissolved in water. Um, wash your radiation. When you get your food, wash it because pollution settles on the food that we eat. 
But now, here's the important part. We got three minutes to do it. Um, no, I got, that's why we started 10 minutes after. I can slow down. Selective uptake. There's two apples. Which one would you rather have? The right one. The right one? Well, that's the Bulgarian apple. That's true. But basically, most people like this organic, nice red apple. But I already ate it. What's left? The Bulgarian apple. I say Bulgarian because over there, this is a perfectly good apple. <laughs> Romania, Moldova. Um, but this is all that's left. The body will take it. That's the same way about our food. The body wants the very best. It wants good grade of sulfur. Touchy. It. There's a radioactive isotope called sulfur 35. That's the bad apple. It has a half-life of 87 days, which means after 87 days, if you got it in you, half of it's still there. It's been shooting off those alpha and beta particles. Where do we find sulfur? Cruciferous vegetables, onions and garlic. We should be eating some of this every day. Got okra over there, I love okra. These are good foods. Potassium, the body needs potassium. It's good for your muscles, it's good for your kidneys, good for sex organs, good for your liver, but there is a, if you're not getting enough potassium, the bad apple is cesium-137. If you're, uh, and that has a half-life of 30 years. Whoa, where do we find potassium? In the plant kingdom, you don't have to write all these things down, just go on a Google search, potassium, vegan potassium sources. Got soybeans there, broccoli, raisins. I mean, it's, that's where our food's supposed to come from. If we do a lot of sweating, smoke, or a lot of salt, we gotta have even more potassium in our diets because it causes us to lose more. Iodine, iodine is one of the uh, very important minerals in our body. If we don't have enough iodine, we're gonna get iodine-131, which is the most carcinogenic of all radioactive isotopes. It has a half-life of only eight days, but if you live near an a, a atomic reactor, it's always putting out iodine-131. It's just always gonna be there. Don't even live near one of those places. So where should we get our iodine from? Well, you can get it from sea vegetables, but now we're saying the sea's polluted. Where else can you get iodine from? There's other sources of iodine. You have some, some for breakfast, strawberries. Where is your iodine in your body found? The thyroid, that's your thyroid hormone. So basically, you might get your iodine-131 in your thyroid. How do you get rid of it? Charcoal. Just take some charcoal tablets, put them in your mouth at night. At night, they will slowly dissolve, you'll be swallowing it, and as you swallow it and it passes down your esophagus, it will take the 131 out of your thyroid and out of your body. How does it do that? Sort of like a, a magnet. As a magnet gets near metal, it attracts the metal to it. It does the thing, same thing. Charcoal attracts um, toxins. Iron. What, what's it called when you don't have enough iron in your body? Anemia. Don't want anemia because there is something waiting for you. It's called plutonium-238 and 239 with a half-life of almost or well, not almost, 88 years. 88 years, that's gonna be in your body. That's the bad apple. Where we get our iron from? Soy, pumpkin seeds, tomato. The thicker the sauce, the better. I like Italian spaghetti, good. Your fruits, deep green leafy vegetables, fine, good sources. You can also get it from uh, blackstrap molasses. If you know someone with anemia, give them two spoonfuls of blackstrap molasses in warm water at night, drink it, they'll bring their iron up. Also, raisins are very high in iron. D a dried vegetable, fruits are. Calcium, all right, if you don't get enough calcium, we got strontium-90, which has a half-life of, oh, up there, yeah, almost 29 years. Where do we get our calcium from? The plant kingdom again. Soy milk, 290 milligrams per, per um, 100 grams per cup, really. Deep green leafy vegetables have far more than cow's milk have it. If you have strontium-90 in you, you wanna take pectin. It's found in the peelings of apples and, and uh, that white stuff underneath the citrus color, you know, that white stuff, uh, carrot, 
peelings, it will chelate these things. Yeah, here it is. Sunflower seeds, the white stuff in here. The, this, sometimes when you peel them in, you get that little white stringy thing, eat it. It's got pectin. Uh, soybeans, good, and I like it, Dama May. Um, care skins. And they're finding that milk now has strontium 90 in it. We're told the time will come when it's no longer be safe to take milk, cream, and eggs. Folks, we're past that time. Zinc, the body needs zinc. If you don't get it, you're gonna get zinc 65, that's the bad apple, and we can get our 244 days of half-life. We get it in legumes, we get it in nuts, we get it in whole grains, we get it in, I like, like uh, nori, um, tofu, great sources of it. All right, last little part. Oh, I got a few more minutes here. There's a term that you need to become familiar with. I'll write it down because I don't have it written on my slide. But it's very important. Biomagnification. That's a very important to uh, to topic because basically we are biomagnifying things in our bodies all the time. So let's take some ocean water, nice and clean ocean water, but all of a sudden, uh oh, Fukushima, we get a little bit of radiation in there. Very small amount, let's say just about 0.02 parts per million. But living in the water, there is plankton. It's going to increase the magnification in this little cell, maybe up to five parts per million. Well, there are herbivorous fish, you eat the plankton, now it's up to almost 300 parts per million. But there are carnivorous fish that eat the herbivorous fish, and now it's up to 2,500 times or more um, parts per million. What's the next step on the food chain? Us. It's no longer safe to eat meat because everything is biomagnified. Let me give you an illustration, the story of this. I have a friend. He's a neurosurgeon now, but he was a Navy doctor. And um, he told me the story about a ship that was off the American uh, naval ship off the coast of the Philippines. They got the influenza on the ship. And everyone but the captain got influenza. How many of you have ever had influenza? It knocks you down, you cannot work. So they had to drop the anchor and just sit there until people got well enough to run the ship. After a few days, a couple of guys were feeling better, so they went out and they did some fishing. And they were amazed. They caught a bunch of lobsters. And so they decided, hey, we should take these lobsters to the captain, to the cook, and have them make them for the captain. So they prepared these things for the captain, these lovely lobsters. And uh, <coughs> the captain was locked in his room, went, knocked on the door, and he took them in, closed the door. He didn't want to get uh, influenza. He loved the lobsters, and he got the worst case of influenza of anybody. What's the purpose for the lobster? It's the buzzard of the ocean. Now, if you've ever been, any of you in the Navy, if you ever go in a, in a Navy ship, back then anyway, I was on Navy ships, the toilet is you got the nice seat you can sit on, but then you got a hole that goes right down to the ocean. You can see the ocean flowing by. So you got these six sailors going to the toilet and just plopping into the water, and it's sitting there filtering down through the water, and, um, and one day a lobster's walking by, and it hits him on the back of the head. And he, whoa! And he looks up, and he cries out, manna! And all the lobsters come to the area, and they just were feasting on the feces of the six sailors. What was the captain eating? Processed feces, full of viruses, and he got the worst case at all. If you were eating anything from the animal kingdom, you were eating biomagnified toxins today. That's the world, 50 years ago, not that problem. We're living in a whole different world than most of us grew up in, a whole different world. Okay, a few more things. I, I'll just go into my time is up. Um, <clears throat> fried foods. How many like French fries? I love French fries. I love them. But when you fry foods, when you, especially potato chips, 
it produces a thing called acrylamide. The World Health Organization uses acrylamide to sterilize water. And in, in potatoes, according to the World Health Organization, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations stated that acrylamide levels in foods are a major concern. Ovarian and endometrial cancers have been associated with high levels of acrylamide. Basically, a bag of potato chips have acrylamide at 500 times above what they use to sterilize water with. I like French potato chips too. How about night lights? Another study just done in Israel, and it was published in a, in a, well, here it is, the magazine called Chronobiology, Chronobiology International. Women living in neighborhoods with low light. They took a satellite photo of a country at night and then they sent epidemiologists into those areas to see what the cancer rates difference were, breast cancer, in dark areas, lighter areas, in bright areas. Women who lived in dark areas had a relative risk of one for breast cancer. That's pretty good, relative risk of one. All right. Those who were living in lower light areas had a risk 37% higher. Those who lived in bright areas had a 64% greater risk of developing breast cancer. <coughs> We've already looked at that one. We've already looked at that one. Yeah, I'm sort of, I guess, yeah, I'm starting to repeat other slides that I took out. Any questions at this point? No questions? Okay, then we're going to take a break. We will be back in 10 minutes.